There you go. We're doing the Greek golden age. All right. So now we'll take a look at all of the great things happening after the end of which traumatic crucible that the Greeks went through. What was the war? That was a dramatic and traumatic crucible of their civilization. It came in two different phases. There you go. The Greco-Persian War is what that's referred to. It's seen as a watershed moment in ancient history because, what, by the way, what's a watershed moment in history? Okay, the Rocky Mountains are a watershed. What does that mean? All right, so we've got water that flows to war, or excuse me, uh, so we've got water that flows away from the Rocky Mountains, right? Here's the Rockies, right? What direction does the Missouri go? It goes that way. And then what direction does the Mississippi oh, go? So it's a point. Down. All right, there you go. So it's a turning point for the water. And all of the, like the Columbia River and all that stuff, which direction does that go? That way. All right, so that's a watershed. Things go in different directions. So if I say a watershed moment in history, that means there's a big change, a dramatic change in the course of events. Persia's still a big deal. I mean, really, this is just a sideshow for Persia. But because of them losing twice to the Greeks, what do we start to see the rise of now? Greece. Greece, democracy, Sparta, and now an empire. All right, so at the moment, at the moment, do we have this lovely building yet? This edifice. What is this edifice called? The Parthenon. And what is the? What are these? You know, uh, rims called. The Acropolis. So the Acropolis is a traditional uh, defensive uh, spot for the ancient Athenians, but they do not yet have the Parthenon. We'll get to that here in just a second. If my remote was actually plugged in. Give me a, a hot second. Uh, there it is. All right. So the Greeks are going to be led by which dauntless individual during their Greek golden age? He gave a eulogy for all of his great Athenians and all the cool things that they're doing. Pericles. So this is known as the Periclean age as well. Periclean Athens will be sadly short-lived. But a lot of big things happening here during this roughly one generation of people. All right, so Athens, they're going to be uh, dominant around the, uh, the Aegean Sea at this point because of a little thing called the Delian League. All right, so here we've got the Aegean. Here we've got, you know, the outskirts of the Persian Empire. This satrapy is relatively weakened by the fact that the Greeks won because now uh, how is Athens able to dominate all through these yellow zones? They've got the navy, and what are those navy, naval ships called? Three different levels, so triremes, tri meaning three. So we have three different levels, and how many oarsmen? Uh, so we've got 170 men at any one time that are rowing this thing, and so they're going a lot faster. And so this is, you know, this is a sweet little thing that's working out for them. So you can see the triremes right here. They dominate and they look cool while they're at it. These are the battleships of the day. But the Spartans also have their own little thing going on too, and they're in competition with Athens. So both sides are doing a little thing they call peer polity, where they are competing with one another to try and get the attention of neighboring states so that they can have a little bit of, you could say dominance, you could also say friends, all right? So uh, is it easy to have an empire and still maintain a democracy? No. Why not? What happens? Because it contradicts itself. Totally contradicts itself, because in order to vote, where do you got to go? got to go to Athens, and you got to go to the Pinex. Rome will have a similar issue later, where they grant citizenship, and you have to go to Rome if you want to be able to vote. You have to actually go. Most people can't make the trip. Same thing for here in, in Athens, but remember, Rome does not have a democracy, so they have a republic. It's different, at least for a time. And now in this democracy, you can't participate unless you actually go. But we're going to enter into a phase that the uh, Athenians are going to start to call a radical democracy. All right, so so what they'll have is the Council of 500. So these guys are uh, hanging out uh, around the Phoenix and they're making big decisions, preparing legislation, that kind of thing. They're kind of like Congress today. Then we've got the Council of the Areopagus. What I mean, if we're using American terminology here for the uh, the um, balance of power, what would you call this branch of the government? All right. So up here. Uh, for the Council of 500, would this be executive, legislative, judicial? Legislative. This is legislative because they're legislating. They're making the laws, and this is where you have the most voice in politics. Whereas the Council of the Areopagus, remember, what kind of members are part of this council? They're the ex-archons, many of them Aristos, because for the time being, you're not paid. All right, that change will come about later, but for the time being, you're not paid. So in order to do this, you must have what? 
you got to have money. Otherwise, how are you going to feed yourself, right? So it's guys with money that are doing it. So Aristo families are part of it. Later, they're going to make it so that it's a paid gig, and so then it opens it up for democracy. But the benefits of this thing uh, is that we have a much more direct democracy. Does my voice matter in a Greek democracy? Does my voice matter? If I'm a citizen and I go to the Pinex and I vote, does it matter? Yes. yes, it does. If I vote uh, today in America for the president, sorry, but does it really matter? No, because someone else makes the decision for me based upon our votes for president. All right, So it's different. It's not direct democracy in America today. It's something different. All right, But another thing, though, too, is we have uh, the elites that are still part of this thing and still feel that they've got a little more of the voice because where did they end up? Where do they often end up, especially if they've served in war and become a general or an archon? Area. They become part of the area pocket, so they've got a chance of still having a little more of a voice that keeps them happy. So we still see that what many people will call the natural order. Natural order meaning uh, we have equality before the law in this democracy, but at the same time, the wealthy still have a little bit more power than the not so wealthy, all right? So that keeps people happy. What are some possible problems, though? We discussed a lot. I mean, yesterday our uh, say no to democracy people, they ended up winning in our debate, right? So part of the reason they, ran, they won, what do you think, group one? What do you guys have to say about the problems of democracy? Huh? Corruption is one thing. What else could happen? Is the mob rule easily swayed? Yes. Yeah. All right. We saw that with the, uh, with the Melians and with the Mytilians. Uh, how mobs can easily be swayed depending upon the speaker. Uh, I love the quote yesterday. Uh, I think it was Maddie who said, "Some you know guy wearing a toga backwards could convince everyone of the way to do things all of a sudden just because of the, that's the way they say it, right? It's so just the way they put it." And so there are ways to convince the crowd. Good example of that is with ostracism. Remember, what does ostracism do? It isolates people and removes them, removes them from Athens. Now, when we were talking last time, I, uh, I, I made a mistake. I think I told you that they're gone for one year. It's ten years. Ten years is, that, is how long you're kicked out of Athens. Do you still maintain your citizenship? Yes. yes. Do you still maintain your property? Yes. yes. Can you come back? Well, ten years in one day. Ten years in one day, you can come back. Does it still suck? Yeah. What's the point of doing it? To get rid of what kind of people? What? Icky people, yeah. So it could be the rabble rousers, the icky people that we don't like. But it could also be the popular people. Now, what kind of, how do they orchestrate these things? You notice it's all written into these pieces of pottery. How do you orchestrate how to vote against someone? You write the name and you claim it's someone else's. And then, the, you know, the guy that's illiterate is like, oh. Seems legit, and then cast that vote. So it's easy to sway the mob. Once again, a good example of that is Themistocles. Is Themistocles kind of a big deal? What battle did he fight at gloriously in part one of the Persian Wars? Marathon, yes! He was one of the shock troops that struck at Marathon. And then, was he a part of raising the Trireme fleet? I mean, it would not have happened had it not been for him. So who can we thank for saving Western civilization? Themistocles, because he gave us the wooden wall that the oracle predicted would keep the Persians from victory. Ah! Love them! Love them too much, though, because what they do? They no. banned They're like, hey, you're kind of a big deal. You should probably leave now. What? Why? Because it's democracy. Let's open it up to everybody, man. All right, so they kicked him out, but hey, that worked out well for Pericles, because Pericles will then end up coming in a little bit later, and he's going to bring us the Greek Golden Age. So Pericles is going to end up being kind of a big deal. Let's talk about why. First of all, at the moment, oh, there goes my remote being weird. There we go, and good. So, no. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, this is annoying. I'm just going to put it down. I'm just going to put it down. All right, so Pericles is thinking we need to find a way to make Athens look amazing. All right, so after Themistocles is kicked out, he ends up going where, by the way? He ends up going to, not Sparta, Persia. 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 Pers
there's another guy that's going to do that later. All right, so we're going to end up sending him off on the, the great unknown, and he'll end up going to Persia, to Xerxes, hanging out with him. Now, um, uh, Pericles, when he comes in, decides it's time to make our city look like the awesome thing that it is, a leader of an empire, a leader of this Delian League, a leader of democracy. And how do you show that besides just saying, you're a citizen, come and hang out in Athens and vote? You make it look pretty. Why does D.C. have to be clean and have to be so much more? Yeah, all right, so it's got to look sweet, doesn't it? And have you guys been to D.C. and noticed all the marble? Why the marble? It's like strong. It just makes us look fake. Oh, I don't even want to tell you fancy. It makes us look really good. And also, it's just like strong. It also is inspired uh, yes, by Greece. Greece. And it's inspired by Greece and Rome. All right, so marble edifices start here in Greece. They'll be carried over to Rome, and not only for its strength and its e relative ease for building things, but also because white, it's a sign of purity, right? So uh, you want your government to seem pure and good and wonderful for its people. And he's thinking, here, we need to make Athens look the part. So he's got some great quotes that we're going to hear uh, in a little bit here. We're going to watch a little film about how he's doing this and what it all means. But he's going to say that all kinds of enterprises should be created for the arts and employment of the people. Now think about that. All kinds of edifices, buildings should be created, not only for art, but also the what? Employment of the people. You've heard of the New Deal, right? Yes. You've heard of these things to build infrastructure and put men to work. Where'd we get this idea? Pericles. Do we need a Parthenon? No. But does it put men to work? Yes. Even if it's at great taxpayer expense, what do you think? Is it worth it? Yes. Tremendous taxpayer expense to leave an edifice behind and also put men to work temporarily? Maybe not worth it? Let's see. Let's take a look at this video. You've got some discussion questions coming in a second. So get ready for those. The Athenians were now looking for a leader who might fulfill their newfound sense of imperial glory. They found a man who seemed the perfect reflection of this new ideal. A man that would change the face of Athens forever. A man named Pericles. It's probably not a more important figure in the history of classical Greece than Pericles. He was the leader of Athens at the height of its power and of its artistic achievement. He was the figure associated appropriately with bringing Athenian democracy to its climax, to its height. But Pericles was no obvious democrat like Themistocles, for he had been born into one of Athens' most elite families. And perhaps because of his aristocratic origins, Pericles knew what the people of Athens now wanted. A city fit to rule an empire. It seems clear that Pericles had in mind to create a city whose greatness would be admired by the people who live there, by everybody else in the Greek world, well into the future. Heracles announced a glorious new vision to the Athenian assembly. All kinds of enterprises should be created which will provide inspiration for every art, find employment for every hand. We must devote ourselves to acquiring things that will be the source of everlasting fame. Heracles turned his attention to the Acropolis, the sheer peak in the center of Athens, home of the city's patron goddess, Athena. Twenty years earlier, the Persians had burned down the temples that stood here. Ever since, the Athenians had left these ruins untouched as a memorial to those killed in the war. But Pericles had other ideas. He 
proposed a massive reconstruction plan. At its center would be a new Parthenon, a temple to Athena, and it would be one of the most astonishing buildings of the ancient world. This new construction program was of unprecedented magnitude and expense. The Parthenon in particular was extraordinarily expensive. It was filled with all sorts of architectural refinements. Pericles planned to spend over 5,000 talents in the first year alone. A total budget of more than a billion dollars in today's terms. This project would require 20,000 tons of marble. The Athenian quarries at Mount Pentelicus, just outside the city, resounded as hundreds of workmen traced out and carved great blocks of marble from the mountain. <laughs> This temple would be decorated like none before. Sculptors and craftsmen were gathered from all over the Greek world. With them stood Pericles, for he treated the building of the Parthenon as his own personal project. He selected architects, he selected the men who designed the plans. Pericles was directly involved in the planning process. Some protested that he was decking out the city like a prostitute. But when the building was completed in only 15 years, his critics were silenced. and still is the most glorious symbol of Athens' empire. Here was the spiritual heart of the city, the mark of her wealth, power, and artistic genius. When you first came through the door, you'd have been just stunned. You'd have been confronted immediately by an enormous 40 foot high statue of Athena in gold and ivory and studded with jewels. I think the, the impression of a statue of that size and with that kind of dressing it must have been truly overwhelming. Pericles had embellished his temple like no other. Though this astonishing statue has since been lost to history, other treasures from the Parthenon have survived for over 2,000 years. The most famous is the Parthenon Frieze. 500 foot long stretch of carved marble which ran around the inner wall of the temple. The Parthenon frieze is only two and a half inches thick at its maximum depth, and yet in this space the sculptors carved rank upon rank of crowded figures, a great procession of Athenians, glorious and elegant. Here, Pericles offered his fellow citizens a vision of themselves and their democratic state at the height of their glory. Democracy itself becomes heralized in that monument. It's a very democratic thing that wants to include all those citizens who participated in beating off the first great threat to democracy, which was from the Persians. 
These are ideals to which you can aspire. The monuments that Pericles built for his fellow Athenians still stand on the peak of the Acropolis. They remain the most striking legacy of classical Athens, an enduring testament to the achievements of the world's first democracy. Yes! All right, so how was it that Pericles did it? So let's see with the first one. What do you think? How is he working to build the power and prestige of Athens? And why is it necessary? You heard America's the greatest government on earth and protects democracy and freedom, and then you show up and you see slave markets. And then you show up to Washington, D.C., and you see not only slave markets, but you also see it's a dirty, disgusting city. One of the dirtiest cities I've ever been in is New Orleans. It stinks. It smells. It's a cool town, but it smells bad everywhere you go. I mean, there's garbage and refuse and Stinky people everywhere you go, and vomit, and you name it, right? Another nasty city I've been to was uh, in Germany. It was called Bad Aachen, and Aachen was probably the second most disgusting city I've been to because in order to jump over a pile of poop, I landed in a pile of vomit, and it was disgusting, all right? And then, you know, it just got worse from there. Uh, and not to mention the weirdness of the nude bathhouses. Everything was weird in Bad Aachen. Yeah. There's a story there. Bad Aachen is a bad place to be. <laughs> Woo! All right, some other time. So you get the point. Not something that represent freedom, democracy, glory, those kinds of things, cleanliness. How is Pericles doing it? Making it pretty. All right. What do you think? Is it worth the expense? Yes. You yeah. See how? Did you hear how much he spent in one year? Yes. A billion dollars by today's standards. Now think about that for a second. That pays for the labor. That pays for the workmanship. All of the cool things that's going into it. The marble itself. That's one year. How long did it take to build, build this thing? Fifteen years. Which, by the way, is like ungodly cool and ungodly fast because pyramids took much longer. Cathedrals later in Western civilization will take almost two hundred years in many cases. Like Notre Dame, 200 years. This was 15. Now think about that. If we're using the average, it may not have cost this much every year, but if we're using that average of $1 billion a year, what's that going to cost? That's ridiculous. That's a lot of money. And a lot of his tax-paying residents, tax-paying former Aristo families are saying, you are parading our city around like a prostitute. Who agrees? Not worth it. Prostitution of our town. Oh, well. They're going to look all pretty so you can bring your cores and your mechs from all over the world to come and see this place. No, we don't need it. Anyone agree? Has anyone seen it in person? Huh? All right. Was it astounding? Awe-inspiring? Glorious? And that's 2,000 years later. Almost 2,500 years later, right? Now, much of this building will be pillaged, by the way, over the course of the years. Uh, uh, the Brits, the French, you name it. Uh, armies that go passing through Greece will take pieces of it. And so the uh, that, that uh, edifice that was only two and a half inches thick at its depth, um, so the Parthenon Frieze is what that was called, that is going to be disassembled by chunks and taken by foreign invaders and it will be taken back to their homelands like Britain or France and put into museums or in rich people's houses. And so the Greeks are starting to finally get all of that stuff back, although some of it's been lost to history, as you heard with the, the statue of Athena. Yes? Wait, what happened to the statue? Uh, gone. Just disappeared from history, probably after a pillaging army came through and destroyed it. Maybe it fell over. Who knows? Just gone. Gone. Destroyed. So Pericles gives us a great quote where he says, Our whole city is an education. For our citizens excel all men in versatility, resourcefulness, and brilliance. And is this edifice, it's a black screen right now, but is this evident edifice that we saw there with the Parthenon a good indication that our citizens, all men, excel in versatility, resourcefulness, and brilliance? Absolutely. So because of this, how will Athens become the center of the intellectual world? Persia might be the, the center of all things that are cool with empire, because they still got things like the Hanging, ba uh, hanging Babylon Gardens, excuse me, Hanging ba Gardens of Babylon. They've got other really cool stuff going for them. They're the biggest empire on earth. But is Athens quickly becoming the, the intellectual center of the earth? Definitely. Is the Parthenon a wonderful wonder? 
I, you know, I'm going to I'm going to be honest. I've forgotten the list, but no, I don't think it is. I know the temple in Alexandria, which also is gone. Uh, oh, it's like um. Well, I think well, that was part of it. Pyramids. I don't. I don't think it's that. But yeah. It's, it's Hanger, Babylon. That was one. Yeah. Let's Google it. All right, but we're going to move on to Socrates now because Socrates, man, myth, and legend. Let me know on that list, though, Damon, when you figure it out. All right, so uh, Socrates, he is part of this time period as well as a man that totally goes against the grain. Now, uh, you know, spoiler alert, Socrates will be killed as a traitor because he perverts the youth. Perverts the youth. Now, that's not because he's sleeping with boys or anything like that. Not that kind of perverts the youth. It's, he's perverting the youth by making them question everything. And he goes completely against the grain of what's acceptable in Greek society. Because think about it. Take a look at this man. Does he look beautiful? Yeah, right, yeah. Oh my gosh, he's gorgeous, isn't he? So first of all, a little something about him. Socrates is what's known as a sophist. And at this time, the sophists, or the, uh, the people that are, are, are considered men of wisdom, is what that's referring to. So sophists, as men of wisdom, they're expected you know, to go out there and question everything. And that's exactly what he's doing. And one of the, I mean, it's not only what he says, but also the man that he is, the way that he presents himself, that just shows that he's very different. He's really a revolutionary in so many ways. For instance, uh, ideal types of Greek beauty, all right? When you think of a, a, an ideal Greek man, all right? Do you think of this? Yeah. Okay, you think of Achilles, all right? You think of Gerard Butler's Rippling Ninth Abs, yeah. all right? You think of that kind of thing. Totally swole. You think of that, all right? Now, fun fact, by the way, throughout ancient history in, the, in Western civilization, all the way until the first century AD, the concept was that women are cute. I mean, they're okay. But if you want to see true beauty, you look at a man. Men are true. I know it's laughable today, isn't it? Men are just awkward and gangly and ugly, honestly. <laughs> but women are cute, right? So, can we agree, gentlemen? We should be looking at you not going there. But point being, that Western civilization, until even in the Romans, the Romans felt the same way. If you want to see true beauty, you look at a man and their true beauty. The Persians were the ones that thought that women should be idealized, that women are beautiful, that you should, you know, that the relate the natural relationship is between a man and a woman. They believe that. Alright, so consider that for a second. A truly beautiful man does not look like this, okay? I mean, he was seen as being uh, being ugly because his eyes bulged. He had a huge nose. He had a big old rotund belly. Even though he doesn't work a day in his life, he walks the city asking questions and pissing everybody off, and they feed him for it, okay? So one night, he was at a party, and there was a drunken, beautiful, rippling abs kind of Greek guy that was there making fun of him, and they're having a little drunken revelry, and he was like, well, I'm obviously gorgeous, and you're not Socrates, or Socrates, if you will. And so Socrates uh, convinced him through argument, saying, you know, I actually have bulging eyes, which are far more beautiful than yours, because it allows me to see more. They're bigger, and I can thus see more. And then the Greek goes, no, my nose is beautiful. And he says, yes, but I have a much larger nose to allow me to smell more. I have bigger ears, which allows me to hear more. I have a bigger, ugly mouth that allows me to speak more. And my belly is full of plenty of food and wine, which you cannot say the same thing, young man. And then at the end, the man's like, all right. You truly are more beautiful than me. And so this is just kind of the way he works. I reason is becoming a new thing at this time because the Persian Empire has already started developing new uh, types of theories about astrology and astronomy and mathematics. I mean, after all, who's going to give us zero and all of those kinds of fun new things for math? Right, the Persians. And, and so the Greeks are going to take many of these ideas and apply them. Like, for instance, there's a Greek uh, mathematician named Thales at this time, same time as Socrates. Thales came up with the idea that uh, you can measure the height of the pyramids. No one else knew how to do that at the time. Like, how tall is it? I don't know. Big. Look at it. It's huge. It's huge. Huge. All right, so, uh, <laughs> so Thales said, I don't have to do it. What he did is he took a measurement of here is the pyramid shadow at high noon versus here is the pyramid shadow at this other time of day. And then he says, look, trigonometry, geometry, right? So this is 
revolutionary stuff. And Socrates is very much a part of this thing because he says you must question everything. He says, after all, that the unexamined life is not worth living. Amen to that. Do we have any sophists in here? Any philosophical, philosophically bent individuals? The unexamined life is not worth living. And I would say the same thing of your faith. The unexamined faith is not worth having. Okay, that's my little Christian plug for the day of, you know, you got a question. Whether it's your faith, whether it's your parents, whether it's your country, whether it's your president, whether it's your friends, whether it's yourself, you must question everything. Because how else do you find truth? You just blindly accept everything? No. That's not true faith. That's not true belief. And you don't believe me? Talk to Saint Thomas Aquinas. You know, someone who's going to be quoting Socrates like crazy about a thousand years later? Saint Thomas. Thomas Aquinas, he's a very noted Catholic theologian who takes some of the things that Socrates says and says, yeah, totally, I'm just going to make it a little more Christian. And so therefore, it fits through the centuries. I don't care if you're living then or now, these things still fit. Hey, let's talk about other cool things happening in daily life in the Golden Age Greek. Name that column, huh? Huh? A pillar. Oh, all right. So this is in your reading. By the way, you should know this. This is all something. So it's also something you should have covered in world history. I'm hoping you did. Bummer. All right. So for you future architects out there, this is known as a Doric column. A Doric column. All right. And then the middle one. What do you notice that's different between the Doric, which is all. By the way, later in the, uh, anyone thinking of being an architect. Bummer. All right. Civil engineer. Okay, so if any of you decide to go into that in college, there's this concept in 20th century architecture called, uh, well, excuse me, 19th and early 20th century uh, architecture where they start to talk about form following function. Form follows function. So if you need something to hold a, uh, a you know, an edifice up, does it need to look pretty if its form follows function? No. I right, look at this building. <laughs> I love this building, but at the same time, is it pretty? No. No. Does the form follow the function of being an oppressive school that where you're put in a yes. box? Man? Yes. Yes, you're in a box, man. Form follows function. You want to break the mold, then let's go learn in the park. But then I can't have my, you know, my technology, so it's not going to work for me. So form follows function here, right? The, the Greeks are going against that mold early on by saying we need to add some cool little stuff to it to make it look neat. We don't just need a pillar. They're going to add some lines for the dorks, but then they're going to say, wait a second, we should make it look even cooler. The Ionic uh, pillars have got a little bit more of like a little ram horn kind of look to it. And then who can tell, this is the easy one now. We've, we've narrowed it down. You've got the two out of three. Who can tell me what this one is called? It originated not in Athens, but in a different ancient Greek city. All right, so later St. Paul, uh, Gothic will come in the uh, 10 hundreds AD, so it's coming later. Corinthian. Very good. That is worth points, madam. All right, so Machiavellians just got two because you stumped everybody. Well done. All right, so the Corinthian pillar, what makes it much cooler? It's, huh? pretty. it's pretty. It's neat. Do we need the form to follow function? No. no. We want something to be oh, gorgeous as a testament of how awesome we are. Now, another thing to note, too, is that Athens at this time, they're going to start to have some problems with Sparta. And what do you got to worry about when you're facing Sparta? They're dying. Oh, They're yeah. dying. They're <laughs> yes. you, you worry about dying and dying noises, right? So luckily for us, Athens is near the sea. There's this place called Piraeus, and this is the harbor. All right, so the Spartans, they can't swim. They're not witches. So it's not like they can, like, swim with their swords and their teeth to go and attack Piraeus. So they're screwed as long as we have what? To connect us. A, a giant wall. Build the wall. Yeah. yeah. That's going to be Pericles for you. Pericles says, let's build the wall. And everybody else is like, booyah, let's do this thing. Because now we can protect Athens and still have access to the sea. And what do we have that's going to be like, hey, hey, Sparta, you don't have that. A boat. A bunch of boats, in fact. The triremes. Now, all of these little areas around here, though, we have other little towns, and these are called Daimes. Daimes. All right, so I think that's how you pronounce it anyway. So make sure you spell that. D-E-M-E-S. You should have had that when you were uh, looking at your democracy versus not democracy argument, right? So the Dems, actually, excuse me, it's pronounced... Pronounced Dems, but it looks like Demes, all right? So D-E-M-E-S. But the Dems, these are what? What are the Dems? 
Because Athens alone cannot survive behind its walls. Other little cities that are dependent upon Athens for protection, and Athens is dependent upon them for what? It's a reciprocal relationship. For armies. All right, armies. And food. You can't grow food inside those walls. You need exports and imports of food and other things to make sure that life is going well in Athens. And for the time being, it is. For the time being, things are neat. Let's talk about some neat things in Athens at this time. The religion is based upon some different cool ideas, like, for instance, hero and mystery cults. All right, so hero cults. Why have, I mean, we've talked over and over again since uh, the end of the summer about heroes, and why create a hero cult? Because they're amazing. Because they're what amazing. What book are you reading right now, Claire? Uh, you're you're reading a few, but which one are you reading? All right, so you're reading uh, Circe, which is the goddess's perspective right, on the whole Odys Odysseus yeah. story. And then this one, Song of, Achilles. Song of Achilles. All right, so have you created your own little hero cult? Of Achilles? I should, yeah. Yeah, right. there you go. All right, so it's not like drinking purple Kool-Aid. We're coming, Achilles, and then gulp, and then we all die. <laughs> Not that kind of cult. But a cult is the idea that we emphasize certain qualities, and we like live those qualities that we like about that hero. And so they're doing that with all kinds of people, not just Achilles, but others and gods. All right? And so then we've got the mystery cults, which is kind of the same thing, but it's more based in like philosophy. Like you don't know. All right. So it's kind of this idea where later in philosophy we'll get Immanuel Kant, who just can't stop asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this whole idea of dare to know will come later, but really it starts with the Greeks. They don't know, and so they make a religion out of not knowing in many ways. All right, now another thing too is that society and culture is heavily influenced with this thing. Like we've got this group of people known as, uh, as medics. Medics, it's not med with a D, medics, where they're like nurses and doctors. Metics are people that are from outside of Athens. They might be from a, uh, a city like near Sparta, and they're like, I don't want to end up with the Spartans, and I don't want to go to the Agogi, I don't want my kids going there. So they move to Athens instead. Now, they pay taxes, and they serve in the military, but what can they not do? They can't vote. So why is this awesome for the Athenians? Because they have all the power. Yeah, we still have all to say, but... They help pay the taxes, so that one billion dollars that we owe for the Parthenon this year, they're helping to pay that, and they're happy to do it because they want to live in Athens. Athens is a sweet city to live in. It's very urban. By the way, anyone know how many people are approximately in, in Athens once they build the walls right as the uh, Peloponnesian War gets started? 150,000 people at the start of the Peloponnesian War. Now, part of the reason there's so many it's because they all cram into those walls for protection from Sparta. But it's got about 100,000 people on any given day before the war even gets started. Now, women, by the way, they have certain things that are going on. Hold on for the Hetaira uh, for a second. So women in Athens, if you are married to... <clears throat> you guys are just writing it out. It's okay. Don't fall for pushing the button too soon. So uh, women in Athens, if they are married to a Greek... Or excuse me, an, an Athenian man who is a citizen... Do they receive any kind of rights? Yeah. Let's put it to the vote. Women are considered people in Athens. Who says yes? Women are considered people in Athens. We have one option? vote. All right, the other option is women are not considered people. They are considered merely property of their males. All right, well, players, the one person that got it right. Yes! All right. What do they have a point? I'll give it to you later. So, Athenian women, if they're married to an Athenian male citizen, they are considered not, I mean, they receive many of the rights of citizenship. They're considered a person. They have legal protection. However, they don't get to what? They don't get to vote. So they have no real influence, but they're still considered a vital part of Athenian life. Because without women, well, what are we going to have? No babies. No babies. And so that's kind of important. And plus, who educates the kids usually? The women. All right, often women, unless you can afford a pedagogue. Who can tell me what a pedagogue is? A tutor, usually a slave, right? So you uh, find some slave that's really smart and can teach, and therefore thus begins the, you know, the career of being a slave to teach it. All right, so uh, then another thing that we get is the Hatira. The Hatira, they're known as companions. That's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> what, are, what are they? Prostitutes. They're prostitutes, yes. Now, these are like high class, grade A, as if you can talk about them like they're me. But that's the way the Athenians would have considered them. Many of them are often foreigners. In fact, Pericles had himself a mistress. Yes, he had a wife, but he didn't like her very much. 
marriage. All right, that was like an arranged marriage. He found himself a hetaira uh, that was quite attractive and uh, became basically not only his personal mistress that he wouldn't let anyone have any time with, but also, hold on, I'm trying to find her name. Yeah, where was it? Aspasia. Write that down. A S P A S I A. It looks like Asp Asia. Ask Asia. So Aspasia was one of those women. She was a foreigner. She was strikingly beautiful. She was a teenager when she met Pericles. Weird. And then he decides, I love you. I want to. I want to. I want you to only be mine. And in fact, they had a child together. They had a son together. And what's going to get super controversial is later, at a very dire time in Athenian history, when they're facing the Spartan uh, nemesis at their walls, uh, Pericles is on the verge of death. And you know who he wants to claim is his next in line. He wants to make the son of a whore his next in line to inherit everything that he's done and maybe even become like a king of Athens. Is that good? No! And that gets him in a lot of trouble, by the way. A lot of trouble. Oh, there she is. Really? Yeah, sorry. Forgot about that. All right, now another thing that they do is they hang out at a place called the Symposium. All right, Symposium is still a word that we use today. Um, uh, in fact, I just heard it used on the news a little while ago. And where it comes from is... If you're not some kind of degenerate, you know where you eat and drink? Do you sit in a chair? Like, would I have this awesome throne if I'm a wealthy man in Athens? You guys sitting in your chairs are all a bunch of degenerates, apparently, or all a bunch of peasants. I am too now that I'm sitting here. I would teach from a couch. I would lay on a couch sideways, and I'd be like eating and quaffing from my goblet of wine as I taught you guys. And then we'd be sitting in this little room, hanging out, and often symposiums are just a place to get drunk, but usually it's men of higher social status that are hanging out, and who happens to be walking around enter entertaining them? Hetaria, <sighs> exactly. exactly. So, uh, women, yes, women of high, you know, prostitute class status. Now, another thing that you could do is end up at the gymnasium. You know what gymnasium literally means? Naked the naked place. Yes, because where do you train for the naked Olympics? In the naked place. PE class is naked, which, by the way, it's only men. So, women had their own gymnasium. I forgot what they called it, but it was like a girl's version where they too would do their exercises and they too would be naked and then the men have their own and so there you can see them preparing for the naked olympics with just properly placed camera angles to make sure you don't see anything right isn't that fun so the gymnasium is a good place to do that now we don't have time to get into the rest of the stuff we'll cover that on monday but there you go